Metro Talk Radio. You're in to all things music. When you see people on television, when you hear people on records of radio, when you see them live, when you see them recording, when you see them in the studio, realize that somebody has to keep it going. Somebody has to be doing it. And the somebody might as well be you. God doesn't have any favorites. You know, he didn't create anybody more special than the other person. So when you see somebody doing something, realize that they had to have a start just like you. And so the next person doing it might as well be you. Welcome to Making It with Terry Woolman, the show that explores the secrets, successes, and strategies for making it in the music biz. And now, here's your host, Terry Woolman. Welcome to the show and thanks for tuning in. I want to let you know how much I appreciate you joining us on our show. And if you missed last week's interview with Amy Keys, you can hear it and all of our episodes at entertalkradio.com slash making it or download our app and take us with you. By the way, you're just listening to the sounds of Paul Jackson Jr., our guest today. So often I get asked questions about the creative process. So I created this show to focus on what it takes to have a lasting career in the ever-changing landscape of the music business. You're really in for a treat as I've invited my friends, some of the best and brightest in music to share their stories on how they have influenced the music that has shaped our lives. I guarantee you're going to love it. So let's get started. My guest today is guitarist, producer, composer, Paul Jackson, Jr., Paul Jackson Jr. has appeared on the recordings of Michael Jackson, Whitney Houston, Elton John, Barbara Streisand, Celine Dion, Quincy Jones, Luther Vandross, Ella Fitzgerald, Natalie Cole, B.B. King, Selena, Jennifer Lopez, Luis Miguel, Amy Grant, B.B. and C.C. Winans, Al Jarreau, George Duke, Joe Sample, Barry White, Chicago, and so many others. More recently, Paul contributed his playing styles and composing chops to the Daft Punk CD, which garnered five Grammy Awards and was the number one album in 104 countries. Paul's hobbies include muscle cars, motorcycles, and dog training. Please welcome my guest today, Paul Jackson Jr. Hey, Paul, welcome. Hey, Terry, how you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for asking. I uh, haven't seen you for a while, but I've been keeping up, and I, I know that you are you're out playing and recording and teaching and and doing what you always do so you've been keeping pretty busy fortunately yeah i got my hands full pretty full these days uh i've been doing a lot of touring with jeff lorber and everett harp Mm -hmm. and then uh preparing for a uh semester teaching at uh, the university of southern california in the thornton school of music popular music department under patrice russian and also recording a record with uh, jeff and everett and writing a instructional book, and what else am I doing? Uh, you know, keeping things down at home. So, got my hands full today, <laughs> these days. But uh, I'm grateful, happy, and I'm grateful. Well, yeah, and making sure again, you mentioned, you know, keeping yourself kind of visible at home. You want to make sure the family doesn't forget you, because I I know the kind of hours that you can put in, uh, you know, and just be gone for. It might feel like days, even when you're in town. So, do you, do you? Make sure that you schedule in family time. How do you work that out? Absolutely. Uh, my wife and I still have a date night. We go out on dates every week, and then uh, we like to, you know, I turn the computer off and turn Pro Tools off at a certain time during the day so we can spend time together during the evening watching movies or having dinner or just, just talking, really. And then the same thing with my kids. Even though my kids are grown, my daughter's 30, my son is 26, I still make sure that, you know, I talk to them uh at least every other day and, and uh, get to see them 
as much as I can and, and still date my daughter and still hang out with my kids. And so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's still the priority there, you know, family is, is a major priority. So yeah, just, just, you know, you, we make time for what's important. My family is really important. I, I want to talk to you about family and, and I have a story to share with you, but, but before we go there, I just wanted to like get the obvious out of the way. Your hobbies include muscle cars, motorcycles, and dog training. <laughs> Those are three things I didn't know about you. Can can you tell me pretty quickly what that's about? Well, currently I, I have a uh, 1960. I have a, a El Camino that I've been working on for about six years. And the El Camino I actually drive uh, most often. And uh, so just something I've enjoyed since I was a kid. My dad was into collecting old cars and fixing things up. And uh, actually several years ago, actually about 20 years ago, I uh, put together a 1939 Cadillac LaSalle for my dad that he had tinkered with when we were younger. But I got it restored and, and gave it to him. And, and that really set, set the uh, wheels in motion for me in muscle cars and, and old cars. I just, just like them better. And Do you actually get under the hood and... Uh, are you, do you, are you, do you rebuild a carburetor? Are you that guy? Well, I more install things like, I'll, you know, change the fluids or install right. door handles or, you know, things like that. And you were just uh, going to talk about your, your, like that. your, your dog training. Yeah. That's actually the story is, uh, <clears throat> somebody gave me an imported German shepherd dog and I had bought one from the pet store. And there were two totally different dogs, and I couldn't figure out why. So that kind of set me on a quest to figure out the the ins and outs of the German Shepherd dog, and and that got me into dog training and and protection training and obedience training, and and uh, you know that was that was wow. That was also about twenty years ago. So mm-hmm. uh, just you know something I really enjoy. And currently, I have two German Shepherd dogs, and and uh, you know they just having fun with it. Do you give commands in German? Did you learn traditionally? I did. I, because they are German Shepherd dogs, Deutsche Schäferhunds, I uh, did. I do commands to them. I train them in German. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's wonderful. I'm a, I'm a big pet lover, and and Not I good. also appreciate the the value of um, giving boundaries to your 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 pets. And you know, um, it's it's better for everybody. You know, it helps protect you. It protects other people, and 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 it gives them a sense of purpose. You know, when you do exactly. it with love you and, don't want, and yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to say, you don't, you don't want a dog that could potentially hurt somebody or hurt themselves to, uh, to not be trained. You know, I think every dog owner owes it to themselves to kind of figure out the ins and outs of their dog and make sure that no one ever gets bitten accidentally or, right. you know, the dog is being self-destructive or whatever. So it's, it's, it's a good, I'm, I'm a big advocate for uh, dog training. Mm-hmm. Well, thanks for, for, for sharing those, those personal stories. I want to talk about family before we talk about music, because I know how important that is to you. And partially the reason I know that is not just from knowing you, but, but having had the pleasure of knowing your mom and dad. And I remember years ago, I believe it was at um, Universal City Walk in L.A. at a club. I was sitting at a table with your mom and dad <clears throat> at one of your shows, and I, and I recall how proud they were of you. It was such a a wonderful experience sitting with right next to your dad and letting him brag all night and, you know, and <laughs> tell stories about you as a kid and how he used to, you know, take you in the station wagon, you know, with all the gear to rehearsals or to gigs or, you know, and so let's talk about your family and the importance of family in your life. Well, you know, it's interesting because, uh, as I said on the bio, I owe my success as a musician to two factors. Uh, One of them is my relationship with uh, Jesus Christ. And the second one is the sacrifices that my parents made. Uh, You know, they, uh, my mother's everyday driving car was the biggest van that Chevy made. (laughs) Reason being is because, you know, my, my sister played drums, my brother played keyboards and we had a family band. And then I had buddies, uh, not the least of which were Gerald Albright and Nathan East growing up. Uh, where mm-hmm. we would play these gigs, and and then my father, I played gigs on weekends, and he'd go and sit back then. You know, I was doing like you know three sets a night on Saturdays, and he'd sit with me from you know from nine o'clock till one in the morning, 
you know, listening to me play and, 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 uh, you know, uh, you know, so things like that. So I, I, mm-hmm. I owe all of, uh, all of my success to, to, uh, the fact that they really invested in not just me, but, you know, my brother and my sisters and, uh, and, you know, um, I just, you know, and to even, even after that, when I started making records and started doing sessions, my mom would keep my, uh, my book. And this is before cell phones and before email and before even pagers. Right. And, uh, if you could find her, if you could find her, you could find me. So she used to cook, uh, keep my book and book my sessions and book my gigs. And, and, uh, actually right up until the time she passed away, she was still, you know, doing everything. So, uh, yeah, so my my family is is really really important to me. Well, on your bio, and and I'll actually quote it because I was going to make reference to it. Um, it says they're speaking about you. He attributes all of his success to his Lord Jesus Christ and the sacrifices made by his mother and father. And I really Correct. appreciated that um, that you include that in your bio. You know, I know that your um, spiritual life. Th- is a very important part of your life. And, and I know that your family is important and it's, it's really um, appropriate, but also it's really lovely to see you acknowledge that as part of your, your statement about yourself and who you are. Absolutely. And you, and you hit it on the head. That's, you know, it's, it's not something that I do. It's who I am. You know, <laughs> so that's, uh, you know, you, you, you put it, uh, I couldn't have said it better myself. And, you know, we have, um, you know, there there are people that, that talk the talk, and then there are people like you, our other friend, Abraham Laboriel Sr., you know, that, that walk the walk. And you almost, you know, I, in all the years that I've known you, I don't think we've ever sat down and talked about religion or God or, um, but, but, but everything that, I see you do comes from a spiritual place and, and, and there's a dedication to it. And, and I, I just want to acknowledge that I, that that's, I really appreciate and respect that part of you because that's, that's where it really speaks to me. It's when people are oh, walking the walk and yeah. And, and being compassionate and the bringing integrity to everything they do. And it's not just a business thing. It's a, it's a point of view of, of in life and, and um, and I see that in you every time, you know, it, it, you know, when we have a, f- a couple minutes, you know, running into each other someplace, I still I see it, even though we don't talk about it. Well, man, that's much appreciated. There's a scripture in the Bible that says in in uh, in him being in Jesus, we live and move and have our being. And, you know, it's it's it can't be something that you just do on Sundays and pack away for the rest <laughs> of the week, you know. So uh, right. I, I appreciate appreciate you saying that, but. So growing up um, in L.A., I know you mentioned growing up with Gerald Albright and, and uh, Nathan East, Patrice Russian, of course, even um, Kevin Moore, you know, Kev Mo. You know, you. Oh, yeah. You, yeah. You, you were um, exposed to and a part of a, a really um, talented and, and focused and lovely group of people. I, I want to talk about your early musical training. You know, in addition to your your mom and dad helping, you know, get you to the gigs and hanging out with you and everything, did you start at a very young age and just get put with a great guitar teacher? Was guitar your first instrument? Tell me about the er, your early musical training. Well, I studied uh, piano when I was when I was five, and uh, you know, like from the lady down the street, my mom gave us piano lessons, and and then one day I decided that I wanted to play drums. So uh, we went to the local music store, which at that time was Gardena Valley Music, and there was a set of drums in the window that was $359. <laughs> and my mom looked at me and she said, that is not going to happen today. <laughs> but is there any, anything else in here that you, yeah, exactly. She said, but is there anything else in here that you like? And there was a $20 guitar hanging up. And so I said, let's get that. So I really started studying guitar, really. I got that. I was nine when I got that, but I really started studying when I was 12. And I studied with a guy by the name of Gary Bell. Gary Bell played with people like Fats Domino and some other folks, uh, you know, but it was a really, really great instructor and really spoken through my life. And then uh, later on, I studied classical with a guitarist by the name of Greg Perre. Now, interesting with oh, Greg sure. Perre is we went on. To, yeah. And Greg and I went on to do the music for uh, 
the Martin Television Show and Townsend Television and some other things, and and we still talk all the time to this day. I talked to him a couple of days ago, and and mm-hmm. um, so I studied classical with Greg, and then I went on after I graduated from high school to the University of Southern California as a studio guitar major, and so I studied there with the likes of Duke Miller and Eddie Arkin, and a tiny, tiny bit with Lee Rittenauer and a little classical with John Smith. So mm-hmm. uh, that that was my musical training. So I, I was really fortunate to to be with a lot of great teachers and have a lot of great, you know, instructional experiences. And at USC in the studio guitar program, when you were in it, did it, do you, did you feel fully prepared for uh, starting to do sessions or were you already doing sessions and this was just augmenting, uh, giving you more of a skill set or point of view in different styles? What, what did you get out of the program that, that really served you as a studio musician? Well, one of the things that they focused on at the University of Southern California in, in that program was uh, was reading, the importance of reading, uh, the importance of how chords work together, and uh, and you know playing uh, in an ensemble. So those were some of the things that were that were really really important. A lot of things, to be honest, I got actually from playing gigs on the weekend with uh, people like the Don Johnson Society Orchestra and and um, and the group called the touch of gray and, uh, and then my brothers and sisters and then my buddies at, at uh, high school that, that we, you know, played on weekends. So uh, it was kind of a combination of the two that really helped get me prepared to, uh, to start doing sessions. When I entered SC, I wasn't doing sessions, but by the time I left, I, I actually was. So mm-hmm. uh, that was kind of cool. Yeah. And we're talking about what you got out of it musically, but what was the most valuable life lesson that you got from from being at USC in, in that program? Probably the most valuable life lesson at SC was um, getting along with people. You know, um, it really doesn't matter in this business how well you play if you, you know, to, to coin a phrase, don't play well with others. Um, mm-hmm. If you can't get along with anybody, you can't work, you know. Uh, you could be the best player in the world, the best singer in the world, uh, the best composer in the world, but if nobody likes being around you, then it's pretty much kind of a lost cause because uh, you're not going to find a whole lot of people to work with. So uh, yeah. that's one of the things I think Absolutely. I learned was was co-op- cooperating and and you know listening to other people and you know being able to take instruction and and give positive feedback. So those are some of the things right. that that uh, I've learned. Yeah, at SC. Were were you already um, a pretty social? person or were you kind of shy and uh, less friendly so was, coming was, across as less? No, I was, I, I was, I was a pretty friendly person, you know, but you know, I do when, you know, the, the, the more people you meet and the uh, more experiences and the more situations you're in, you know, you learn to cope in, in different situations. So, right. You know, you learn to cope on different levels. You learn to cope with different personalities. You know, you're, you're taken out of your comfort zone. So, those are some of the things I think are great about not just what I studied at SE, but, you know, people going to college in general. You know, you're out of your, you know, your immediate environment or your familiar environment, and then you're put in a place that maybe is not so familiar and maybe less comfortable. And, you know, you're, you're kind of forced to sink or swim or, you know, and, and, and get involved in, and, and know how to survive. And, and not just survive, but know how to thrive and, and, and interface with, with folks. So, uh, you know, college, I think, is, you know, is, is a great thing for everybody. Yeah, I, I agree. My my college years uh, really provided a lot of solid information and skills, um, but also just perspective on life. Like you said, how to get along with people, you know how to how yeah, to be exactly. um, how to be one of those people that people want to be around, you know, and right and because it it does make a huge difference, especially when you're making music. I mean, there's a lot of technique involved, but it's really about connection and and heart and passion. Right. You know, exactly. I think in addition to groove and tone and, you know, all the, uh, and showing up on time and all, and all of those things, but you still have to have a, a point of view, you know, something to say, some content. Right. Yeah, exactly. Paul, as, I agree hundred percent. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. And I'm not surprised as, as a young guitarist, when you were coming up, you know, you know, before you were in college, did you aspire to be an artist or did you have your sights always set on becoming a studio musician? Well, when I was younger, the focus was being a studio musician. I wanted to, uh, 
work in studios and play with other folks and uh, and do some things like that. And uh, the goal was to be the number one studio musician in the world. That was the goal. Okay. And after I had, I had played on some pretty successful records, I realized that that was kind of an unsuccess, uh, unfulfilling goal and, and kind of an <laughs> unrealistic goal, not from the standpoint of unattainable, but really kind of shallow, you know. And right. so I prayed about it, and I said, "Okay, God, you know what? You know what? What is it that I'm supposed to be doing now?" And uh, I got an interesting answer, uh, you know, because part of prayer is, is listening, waiting for the answer. And the answer I got was kind of interesting. It was, uh, you know, that uh, the Lord said, I, "I want you." At least this is what I heard. That I want you to continue to get better and better and better, so I can put you in more places to bring glory to me. And and that's the answer I got. And I said, you know what? I can run with that. That's something I can run with. So that's what I've been really striving to do over the next of the you know past several years is just get better and better and uh, play in more and more situations and uh, hopefully bring glory to God and and uh, make some good music. So that's that's what I've been trying to do for forty years. <laughs> you know, long, long time. <laughs> I'm an old guy. <laughs> I'm right there with you. Uh, were you, was there um, a, any particular guitarist that was already doing what looked to be your dream job? You know, did you have any professional role models? Absolutely. Uh, the two that would come to mind immediately would be Lee Rittenauer and uh, Al McKay from Earth, Wind & Fire. Mm -hmm. uh, Lee was doing lots and lots and lots of sessions at the time and and he had also studied at USC and also studied privately privately with Duke Miller when he was younger. And then Al McKay, of course, was in Earth, Wind & Fire, but he was doing a lot of writing, producing for people like Ramsey Lewis and The Emotions and, and then doing a lot of records like with Patrice and just a lot of, a lot of other folks. So uh, it was probably those two guys most, most professionally. And also Greg, of course, Perret, because Greg mm -hmm. was doing a lot of sessions as well. So it was probably those three guys more than anyone uh, who kind of gave me a direction to focus at for uh for uh, a career and you mentioned patrice you you had a band with patrice russian and also our our dear friend induga chancellor and uh how did that collaboration come about that was has been a wonderful band for so many years uh, uh patrice and friends well yes actually kind of the, the name says it all I, I actually grew up down the street from patrice and I grew up in the same neighborhood that Nduku grew up in and Gerald Albright and a lot of folks. And so it was kind of uh, a, a natural progression to say, hey, you know, we've been hanging out together for years. We grew up in the same neighborhood. We play music. Why don't we put it together and, and go out and play? Everybody mm -hmm. has, you know, music. And so that's kind of that's that's the way it, it came about. It's just kind of a natural progression of knowing each other and, and hanging out and just, you know, going out to have some fun. So let's talk about um, you, you as an artist as well. There's, you, you, I believe your first record was "I Came to Play" that uh, that was released on Atlantic back in the the late '80s, which is when I put out my first solo record as well. Uh, what what prompted you to record that first record? Did somebody nudge you and push you to do that, or was that part of what you felt was your calling? I felt like my calling was instrumental music. And uh, I was producing a saxophone player at the time, and uh, someone introduced me to Sylvia Rohn, who at that time was uh, head of uh, Atlantic. <laughs> right. And uh, and and uh, she said, "Well, I'd like to hear what you're doing." I said, "Well, I'm working on this music for this saxophone player. I'll let you hear what I'm doing on him." And she listened to it. She said, "Great, this is exactly what we want. Would you like to do a record?" And I said, "Sure." And that's what began the whole thing. That was 1988, actually, when the whole thing began. So uh, I came to play, got, fortunately got nominated for a Grammy, and that kind of set yeah. the wheels in motion of, of the whole, uh, you know, solo artist thing. That was a great time. Um, a lot of us put out our, our first solo records, and Gerald Albright as well, and on, with Sylvia right. Rohn. And, and um, you know, that was back in the day when the radio stations that were playing instrumental music played what they liked. You know, the actual DJs right. got to pick the music. And they'd go deep into your album and all of our albums and, you know, play two or three tracks, you know, rotating them, you know, in the same week. And it was really right. about the music, really about the music back then. And the other fun thing was, was the personalities and the, the uh, personal 
uh, involvement the artists have. You have, you know, you could you could be in town or you could drop by the station and say, "Hey, Terry, Terry right. just showed up. Paul just showed up. Hey, what are you guys doing? Oh, we're playing at uh, Concerts by the Sea this weekend. Remember Concerts by the Sea? We're playing at Concerts by the Sea this weekend. Why don't you come out and check us out? Hey, and this is the new record by Paul Jackson Jr. Hey, it's a new record by Terry Woman. It's like, okay, great, you know. And right. and that right. was the fun part was the was the uh, the interactivity, if you will, that the artists had with, like I said, the DJs made a lot more decisions, not the least of which was, you know, people coming on their shows. So that was, like you said, it was a really fun time. Yeah, absolutely. So let's, let's jump. You've, you've had, I believe, seven solo albums since then. Correct me if I'm wrong. Your most recent is Stories from Stompin' Willie. And Stories from Stompin' Willie, yes. Uh huh. And I know that you, you got that nickname Stompin' Willie from, from George Duke um, over the years of working <laughs> yeah. with him. What's the story behind that nickname? How did you earn that? <laughs> it's kind of, kind of strange because, you know, Stop it Willie really has nothing to do with Paul Jackson Jr. Right. <laughs> but I would go to the studio, I would go to the studio and, and uh, I'd show up and working with George and say, PJ. And then he started calling me PJ Wiggles. Because he, had, I guess he had a song called Miss Wiggles or something like that. He said, PJ Wiggles. <laughs> then he said, PJ Wiggles Stomp. So then it went from PJ to PJ Wiggles to PJ Wiggles Stomp to just Wiggles Stomp. And that ended up being Stomp and Willie. That's so <laughs> yeah, the, the 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 last iteration was Stomp and Willie. So uh, yeah, so I I called it stories from Stomp and Willie because it it was a tribute to George, and uh, you know, and it's like you said, that that's how the name came about. It was in the inimitable creative mind of Mister George MacDuke, he turned <laughs> Paul Jackson Jr. into Stomp and Willie. That's a great story. Yeah. Um, so this album, I, you've been signed to major labels. Is is this one that you put out on your own label, or are you still signed yeah. to a particular? Label? Okay, that's what I thought. Um, mm-hmm. And so, I I'm an independent artist now. A lot of our friends are Bonnie Raitt, Keb Mo. You know, lots of folks are doing it and having wonderful success. Um, mm-hmm. As an artist, what are your thoughts on being an independent artist versus being signed to a label these days? Well, not to cut my own throat here, but um, Ray Parker Jr. said something to me years ago that stayed with me for years. And at the time, I was signed to Blue Note, and I was doing actually pretty well. But he Mm -hmm. said, Paul, you have to remember something, is that the people at Blue Note do not wake up in the morning trying to figure out how to make Paul Jackson Jr. successful. And you do. And I thought about that for years, and it's like, you know, if you make yourself, like my old pastor used to say, a committee of one, and be proactive and kind of invest some time and invest some of your talent, let's invest some of your treasure into yourself and see what the outcome is going to be. And so we did it first with a record called Lay It Back, and that did okay, but then we did it with Stories from Stop and Willie, and that did very, very well. Let me just jump in for a minute and, and say that um, you're talking about Ray Parker Jr. Um, giving you that wonderful advice. And, you know, Ray was one of the first people. He, he said something to me many, many years ago, which was, why wouldn't you have your own recording studio and, and make your own records and, you know, rent yourself, rent, rent your studio out for yourself and put more money in your pocket. So, exactly. he, he, and, you know, and, and that stuck with me as well all those years, you know, it's just, you know, he, he's had a, um, and I agree with him. It's so great that he, he gave you that feedback to, to be your committee of one, as you just said, and, you know, yeah, and bring your career to and your records, get them out there in the way that you know um, right. that you envision it. You know, musically and and business wise and and every way else. And he was also the one that told me to buy recording equipment. Uh, okay, there you go. Right. Yeah, yeah. He's the one. He said uh, we. He and I had a discussion one day, and he said, "Paul, what are you doing with your career?" And I said, "Well, I'm writing songs and doing things." He said, "Well, you." seriously into doing this? He said, yeah. He said, well, then you should buy some recording gear. And at that time it was a 24 track. So I took right. every single penny that I had and, and got a 24 track uh, machine and a small board and, and started trying to figure out how to record and, mm-hmm. and make sound in the whole nine yards. And, and that was the beginning of it. And are you still, are you still doing sessions at home as well? 
Yes, I am. I uh, set up, you know, I have a good setup at home with, uh, <laughs> you know, really good amps and like guitars and uh, my my Bradshaw rig that Bob Bradshaw made for me and and uh, you, you still know, have yeah, the, the, the big one. The, the big sure refrigerator you used to play with. Yeah. Funny story about that. Actually, he made one. He finished one for me about. Um, oh gosh, that'll be about six years ago and. What had happened was he had started working on it, and then I started doing this tonight show and some other things. I said, well, just finish it when you can. So it ended up taking him about four years to finish it. And by the time he finished it, uh, I wasn't it wasn't leaving the warehouse like other things were. More things were, you know, me putting stuff in the car and just, you know, going by someone's house. And so sure. I said, you know, well, that thing's kind of sit, sitting there. I said, I'm going to bring it home. So I brought it home, and it's been working great and sounding great. And I'm having a blast, you know, at home, just really yeah. getting great guitar sound. But, you know, so... Mm-hmm. So it's, yeah. it's working out great. You know, the the record business has changed so dramatically since it began, and, and it's changed even more profoundly since you began your career as a studio musician. What are your thoughts on the, the current state of the music business? Well, they're good it's and they're how bad. How much time you got? <laughs> right. Um, I would say, you want the good part, the bad part? or Well, let me, let me say the bad part. The bad let's, part Let's do is, both. Okay, well, let's start with the bad. The bad part, in my opinion, is that the the climate has sort of convinced people that they don't need to pay for music. And situations like Spotify and Pandora, where the royalty rate is so uh, criminally low, if you will, yeah. uh, it, it's difficult to get paid on songs. Having said that, the good thing is, when you and I started, there was only one way to have a record. That's if we got a record deal, and they promoted it, and people heard it on the record radio, and then our moms and dads and friends could go to the record store and buy it. And that was the only way to be successful. Now, you and I could do a record today. We could have it on Apple Music for people to buy uh, by the end of the week. And also through avenues like YouTube and YouTube Music and and Spotify and Pandora and other places, people can hear it and actually see us and say, you know, hey, I like the music and I can I can buy it with one click. So I am hopeful that common sense or or a sense of decency or pressure to the government will catch up with technology. And, excuse me. <laughs> Bless you. Uh, hoping that we'll catch up with technology and create a system where uh, people can continue to make music on their own and collaborate, but they'll get paid. The, the, the remuneration will, will catch up to a, a decent level. And it's kind of what I tell my students. I'm not looking for you guys to, to adapt. I'm not looking for you guys to try and fit in. or I'm looking for you guys to disrupt this whole thing and recreate it and, and create an environment where you guys can actually make a, a viable and a, and a super living, you know, based on technology, but based on the changes that you guys make. So, uh, so in a nutshell, that I think that's the good and the bad. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, and just to really put a cap on that, um, if you don't want to say it, I will just for an, a, one single example. And I'm sure you've had the same experience. I've had just even a single song, that I've written get a, a million and a half streams, and I made a couple of hundred dollars in, in royalty for that. Exactly, exactly, right. Uh, I think yeah. the record was um, uh, Ed Sheeran one year. I think he got a hundred million streams, and on a record, I think he made seventeen thousand dollars from the right. song. Yeah, so, so the numbers uh, yeah, line yeah, up. Yeah, just, it's yeah, just, just ridiculous. It, yeah. Well, it's criminal. Yeah, and it is yeah, ridiculous. Exactly. It's, it's criminal. You hit a dead on the head. So a lot of you know artist friends that we have um, have made the transition from making money selling their records back in the day when that's what people did, and you would try to break even you know on a tour. Now you mm-hmm. hope to break even on a record so that you can you know so that you can make your nut and make your living out there touring. But you're still, mm-hmm. you know, in both worlds. You're you're a recording artist, a solo artist, but you are also still a very prominent session guitarist. And I know that your um, your income 
has had to have been affected by, you know, if people aren't buying records then people aren't spending as much money on their records. So is, has it, how has, how have you made that adjustment? Is that just by recording at home, you know, or putting some things in the car and going to people's studios or, you know, is that the way you've been punting, you know, to stay um, in the studio uh, with everybody and, and not to turn down some, some really wonderful music oppor- opportunities that might not have major label budgets. Well, what I do is you don't wear any job uh, like a tight garment. And you have mm-hmm. to stay flexible. You stay on your feet. Uh, like in this past couple of weeks, uh, recorded a record with Sergio Mendez, mm-hmm. uh, played, live, played live at the Hollywood Bowl with Jennifer Hudson, and did a gig in uh, St. Louis with, with Jazz Funk Soul with Jeff, uh, Jeff Lorber and Everett Hart. Mm-hmm. So, and then also working on the book and, and, uh, and getting ready for, to teach lessons. So I think what you do is you don't wear any garment too tightly or any title too tightly right. and stay flexible and, and stay open to different ways to, uh, to make money in different ways, different musical situations. And sometimes if you can't find one, you have to create one, mm-hmm. you know, uh, you know, uh, like I said, it, maybe it's time to be creative and, you know, write some children's music or write, you know, an instructional book or, you know, or, or do something maybe out of the ordinary while you're waiting on something else to, to happen. So, uh, I think it's that the, but the biggest thing is you don't wear any title too tightly and you stay available and open for, for some of the things that you might be able to do. It's great advice, and that and that makes sense. And it also keeps you musically uh, inspired and sharp, right? Mm-hmm. So, I, I want to talk about teaching. Uh, why why is it so important to you to teach, and how do you manage to to carve out the time and make your schedule work uh, to a- along with everything else that you do teach at USC? Well, it, it gets back to what I was saying earlier. Is we, we always make time for what's important. And when you think about the fact, like you said, the industry is changing, and I've been doing this for 40 years, uh, you have to replicate what people invested in you and invested into other people. Mm-hmm. Uh, people really worked hard to get me prepared for the music business and a career in music. I need to do the same thing with other people and get them prepared and, and uh, invest in them like people invested in me to, to uh, prepare them. And so you just, you make time and, and you make the effort and uh, it's been very, very rewarding. Plus uh, Patrice gave me the opportunity uh, to start working at the Thornton school. And so it's just, I consider it a, a real blessing and a great opportunity. So I wanted to, you know, to, to take the opportunity and go ahead and do it. I'm so glad you are. And, and I, I agree with you every time that I have the opportunity to teach and mentor, um, it's of great value to me as well as to the, the next generation of upcoming musicians and artists. You know, we, 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 again, it's a great way to, to pay forward, you know, all the right. mm-hmm. guidance and mentoring that we had. And, and, um, and, you know, it's the point of our lives, I think, where, you know, I always kind of felt when when we were younger that this when we were in this part of our lives, we would actually have something more to say, not just not just mm-hmm. the, the music part, but the life part. It's when we're supposed right. to be teaching. Exactly. You hit it dead on the head. It's kind of like, yeah, <clears throat> no, you, you hit it dead on the head. I couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, you you did a you made an instructional video called I came to play the science of rhythm guitar. And correct. It's and the the catchphrase is learn some of the best kept secrets of R and B rhythm guitar playing. Can you share just one of those secrets right now with our listeners to give them an idea of what they would, um, why they might want to go check out this DVD? Well, you know the the DVD is several years old, and I've actually kind of updated some of the things, at least mentally, <laughs> that are in the video. But <laughs> the uh, right. you know. But the, uh, the, the mindset of it still holds true, which, uh, and one of them is simple physics, which is that two bodies of equal size cannot occupy the same space at the same time. And uh, to put it in musical terms, if you're working with a singer 
and she's playing and you're playing right where she's singing and it's her record, guess who's going to get heard? It's not you. So the idea being is that you want to sculpt your part in such a fashion as in that it complements what the lead is doing as opposed to clashes with what the lead is doing. And so that, that actually is one of the simple concepts is, is the concept of space. That's, you know, that was my next question. You know, it's, I'm so glad that you just said that because I was just going to say, you have a very strong understanding of the value of using space in music. And I, and I wanted to know your philosophy about creating space when recording uh, guitar parts. And I didn't think that physics would be the answer, but that makes complete sense to me you know, because yeah, you are, physics. you know, you <laughs> are um, a, a master of space. You know, it's one of the, the, the greatest gifts in, in, I think in your playing, you know, when I listen to a record, you know, where you, where you make your decisions to play and not play are as exciting to listen to as the actual notes that you're playing. You know, it's and it's they and which allows the engineer to mix you louder. You know, so your your parts pop out in a mix because you're, I, I you're thinking about that. Okay. Well, no, I, I really appreciate that. I remember being a young studio musician and going in the control room and listening to the playback, and there'd be you know a couple of guitar players and piano player, and it would be a vocal song, and I would watch the producer, and I would see which parts he turned up and which parts he turned down. Mm -hmm. And I realized that if he's turning your part down, then by and large, you played the wrong part. And that, that's how I started a quest to figure out, you know, what to play and where. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's, that's kind of what started it. So that, that's leading me to just talking about working with Luther Vandross and, um, you know, all the, that's, you know, cause that's a great, example of that style of playing and that kind of really honoring the the melody you know the that the you know of course melody is king you know and the and the mm -hmm. lyric drives the song and and um musicians with um ability oftentimes forget uh the value of of honoring that you know the most important part of the song but you know with luther's albums i you know what were those experiences like were you was was Luther in the room with you a lot of times when you were recording? Was it collaborative? Luther was always in the room when we recorded mm -hmm. guitars. Um, he uh, was the type of person that knew exactly where he wanted things placed and ratios and perspective in terms of also inflections. So... He was a very, very hands-on, uh, exacting kind of person. Not in a bad way, in actually a very, very good way. But yeah, Luther was always there when I did guitars. There's a, a quote, uh, I believe it's on your website, from Luther. And it says, to me, Paul Jackson Jr. is like the Picasso of guitar. Innovative, original, <laughs> and inspired. I'm at the front of the line of those who are his fans, and I'm proud to make music with such a gifted player. It's a beautiful endorsement from somebody who I know was a, um, a friend of yours, somebody that you had a lot of respect for. Oh yeah. Tremendous respect. I mean, just his talent, his work ethic, his creativity, just, you know, an amazing person. L let's go back. Um, we've actually got about 15 minutes left to our conversation. And be before I get to final questions, you know, I was looking at your, your discography and of course it goes quite a way back. Um, I I went to 1973 and saw that you played on the Herbie Hancock's Headhunters album, and it has you down for uh, electric bass and if I'm saying this right, marimbula or is it marimbula? Well, funny story. Actually, <laughs> in '73, I was in junior high school. That is Paul Jackson, the bass player. Ah. Yeah, who played with Herbie Hancock extensively. Now, funny story. He is also <laughs> a junior. He is also a junior, but he never used the junior, which is which, which is why I did. His middle initial is J, and mine is M. Right. So when I started working, I said I better call myself Paul Jackson Jr. to make sure that I'm not confused too often with the bass player. But it still happens from time to time. But yeah, that was 
that was Paul Jackson, the bass player, who now lives in Japan, actually. And uh, oh, but yeah, fantastic. he played with, uh, with with Herbie for years. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Funny story about you, I... funny story about Paul, Paul Jackson, the bass player, is uh-huh. uh, on the song Act- "Actual Proof." I was talking to Herbie, and I said, "Well, how'd you come up with that bass line?" He said, "Well, I played it to to Paul, and he flipped it and put another rhythmic spin on it." And that's the bass line that, that you heard. It was actually, it was written by, by Herbie, but really conceived and, <laughs> and kind of rewritten by Paul Jackson. Right. He, Paul basified it for him. Right. Exactly. <laughs> uh, we, uh, I do know that you, you did play on the 1979 Carmel album by Joe Sample and then also the, the Street Life <laughs> album. And, and uh, that's originally how you and I met was through the Crusaders back in the, maybe in 1981, I think, when I first moved out here. But you've played right. with Billy Preston back then. 1978-79 was an interesting year for you because I see, just just as, as an example, again, we've got Carmel and Street Life, uh, Billy Preston, Late at Night, the Jacksons' Destiny record, Sonny Rollins, Easy, or is that you, or is that uh, the other Paul? Uh, the sure, Easy Living. I think, that's, I think that's the other Paul. Okay, I bet you it is. Um, yeah, and well, we got to tight. We've, we've got to update your discography, but also you played with BB King that year, you know, on Midnight yeah, Believer, uh, Take It Home. So, um, yeah, do you what do you, what is what did that year feel like for you or that time? Was it 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 must have been exciting and exhausting? Well, it was a dream come true, uh, you know, to have grown up in Los Angeles, to have aspired and worked toward being a studio musician. And the watching your dream come true before your eyes was just amazing. I mean, that was also the year I got a chance to work with Ella Fitzgerald. So, uh, you know, just, you know, the, and, and I was still living at home, which is interesting, still living with my parents. And so mm-hmm. I would go to work and I'd play and I'd say, Mom, Dad, guess what? And it's funny because I'd get home at 11 o'clock at night and I'd wake them up. And it's like, <laughs> hey, Mom and Dad, it'd be like halfway, hey, Paul. Yeah, guess who I played with tonight? I played with, you know, like you said, I, I did a record with the Jacksons or I did a record with, with uh, Ella Fitzgerald or, you know, hey, I did a record with B.B. King. And, and they go, oh, Paul, it's amazing. That's exciting. Okay, good night. And, good night, <laughs> son. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Funny, funny story along those times. I was, I was, it was, we were working on the Destiny record and uh, Michael wanted me to play some guitars. And like I said, I was living at my parents' house. And so he called the house. And my mother answered the phone, and he says, hello, uh, is Paul there? And she said, uh, uh, you know, he's not who's calling. He said, this is Michael Jackson. She's like, yeah, right, quit playing on the phone and hung up the phone. <laughs> and fortunately, he called back and said, no, this really is Michael Jackson. It's like, oh, okay, well, I'll find Paul and tell him to give you a call when he, when he gets back home. You know, but that, like I said, it was before cell phones and answering services right. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. so uh, that was that was pretty funny. And also back in the day when artists would actually call <laughs> themselves, you know, when exactly. they wanted to speak to another musician. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's so great. I, it's just, um, you know, I've, well, that's, I, I just, I love, especially having had the, really the pleasure to, to know your mom and dad a little bit, you know, over the, the years when I first moved out here. I love that they just wanted you to wake them up, you know, and right, you know, exactly. or that they they were excited for you, you know, that you would come home at eleven o'clock at night and get to share that with them because they were, as you said, um, their sacrifices uh, and their support um, are a big part of why you are a success. And 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 when I say a success, not just in music but in life, you know, you you've made a great family for yourself and and you are giving back and. You know, and and I know you got that from your family. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, and and uh, you know, I, I I quote my parents every day, and and uh, use life lessons that they gave me every day. So, you you hit it dead on the head. So, in in wrapping up, we've we've got about seven minutes left. I've I have three questions for you. The first okay. is a two part question. The first is a two part question. Since the show is called Making It with Terry Wallman, what does making it mean to you both professionally and personally? Well, let's say uh, professionally first. Making it, I would, I would say that as you is, is setting some definitive career goals 
and then achieving those goals. And I think that's different for everyone. You know, your goal may be to to play the, the baddest solo with, with the number one jazz artist in the world. Your goal might be to write a symphony and have it performed by an orchestra. You know, whatever your goal is, you know, uh, I think making it is, is, is dreaming a dream and seeing that dream be fulfilled. And along those lines, I would tell people that something that I, I heard in church the other day is, is that whatever your dreams are, start to dream bigger dreams. So uh, you can keep moving forward because uh, all the promises of God are yes and amen. So, But I think that's probably what's making it is uh, career-wise. Personally, I think making it would be peace. Um, you know, the Bible talks about peace that passes all understanding. And I think making it would be peace when you come home and the lights are out, and the shades are closed, and, the, you know, nobody's around but, but you, that you can sit and go, you know what, I'm at peace, I'm happy, I'm fulfilled. And regardless of what that looks like, <clears throat> family-wise or financially or logistically, I would say that that's what making it is, is, uh, is peace. Thank you. That's There's a lot of clarity to that. My second question, Paul, is can you share three tips for success that have driven your career? Sure can. Those I try to keep <laughs> handy. <laughs> uh, number one, yeah, <laughs> I try to keep those handy. Number one is uh, success happens when preparation and opportunity meet. Uh, there was a record by the rapper Sugar Free produced by DJ Quick. And the, the essence of the record is if you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. Right. Um, my buddy Ricky Miner, who I've worked up with a lot, a lot of TV shows, uh, wrote a book called There's No Traffic on the Extra Mile, meaning mm -hmm. that uh, to get where other people uh, can't get, you have to do what other people aren't willing to do. So that's a piece of advice number one. Piece of advice number two is when you see people on television, when you hear people on records and radio, when you see them live, when you see them recording, when you see them in the studio, realize that somebody has to keep it going. Somebody has to be doing it. And the somebody might as well be you. Hmm. Um, God, doesn't, God doesn't have any favorites. You know, he didn't create anybody more special than the other person. So when you see somebody doing something, realize that they had to have a start just like you. And so the next person doing it might as well be you. That's point number two. Amen. And point number three, yeah, point number three is when, when you aspire to do anything, work as hard as you can and do everything you possibly can by yourself. And after you've done everything you can possibly do, trust God like you haven't worked at all. Great. That's it. Yeah. My final question to you is at this and point. And the final question life, is: <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to pick the category? <laughs> pick the category. Can I buy a vowel? Right, can like to buy a vowel. <laughs> you right. can. Can I call a friend? Is this a fifty-fifty? Never mind. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> you can call a friend. <laughs> okay. At, at this point of your life, Paul, with with everything that you know to be true, what would you tell your younger self? What would I tell my younger self? Wow, that's a deep question. I would tell my younger self to practice more, write more songs, and uh, be more patient. Um, you know, some things just happen after you try and try and try and try. And then, you know, referring back to my buddy Ray Parker Jr., you know, people saw the success of Ghostbusters and people saw the success of his solo records and the songs that he wrote. But what people didn't see was night after night when he would leave the studio and go and sit up all night writing songs and, and spending his money on studio time and getting favors from friends and learning how to play all the instruments so he could get his songs demoed year after year after year, staying up night and then, you know, getting a studio just enough to record in, you know, first in his house and then in a very small room and night after night, year after year, day after day, just working on his craft. So I would say, you know, write more songs, practice more, and also be patient. That's great advice. Were you, were you an impatient kid? Well, not really impatient, but, you know, I, when, in, retro, in retrospect, 
you know, I said, well, you know, I, you know, the hindsight is always twenty twenty, and the things that maybe I wish I could have done a little differently or, or spent more time, you know, perfecting as opposed to, you know, doing other stuff. So that, that, that's, that's all, <laughs> you know, I wasn't really the patient kid. Right. So in, in our last, <clears throat> in our last two minutes of the show, what I, I want to hand it over to you, what, what would you like to, to say, share? Um, and by the way, we're going to be putting your website up and website to links to your new amplifier and all these other cool things that you got going on. So oh, we're great. Come thank, to thank you. the artist page and, uh, you can, you can hear the replay of this interview, but also you can go to anything and everything, Paul Jackson Jr. So we'll get that to you, but you've, you've got about a minute and a half. I want to hand the floor to you. Well, I just like to say thank you to you because, uh, you know, I don't take opportunities like this for granted and you don't take it for granted that people like what you do or acknowledge what you do or even treat you nicely. So when people treat you nicely and like what you do and acknowledge what you do, it's a blessing. You're ahead of the game. And so I just wanted to thank you for having me on the show. You know, um, I don't, I don't take that for granted at all that, that, that you would take the time to ask me to be on the show and, you know, let me talk about things and share ideas and share music and, you know, I run my mouth. So I just, you know, would just say thank you. You know, I appreciate, so I appreciate the time. Yeah. It's, it's my pleasure. I've, I've had been wanting to, um, not just share your, your story, but your perspective as well, because, um, I know that you have, as you've just graciously and generously shared, you've got a lot to say, you know, not just musically, but personally. And, uh, I appreciate that about you. And, and, uh, you know, the hour has flown by and, and, and it's been a great one. So thank you. This has been fun. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. It has, it really has been fun. So if you want to know about dog training, muscle cars, Paul's new custom amplifier that he designed, uh, the new record and basically anything we're going to send you to, to, um, Paul Jackson, com. but we'll put up the other links to the websites as well. Also, and we thank you. For, forget, thanks. For, go ahead. Forgot to tell you that the next, as we know we're doing the jazz one soul record now, but the next solo Paul Jackson Jr. theme will be called More Story. Can't wait to hear it. Thank you so much, Paul Jackson Jr. Thanks, Paul. And uh, thank you, everybody, Thanks, for spending Barry. the hour with us. We appreciate it. Tune in again next week for another great episode of Making It with Terry Wolf. This is Jackie Bertoni from Jackie's Groove. Come join me weekly on my journey through the music business as I take you behind the velvet rope, interviewing industry notables such as Al DiMiola, Michael McDonald, and Al Jarreau, to name but a few. Listen to their stories on being in the studios recording number one hits and onto the stages throughout the globe. Allow me to be your music historian. You can hear me live every Monday at 2 p.m. and every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time or 24-7 on Jackie'sGroove.com. Ready to get your groove on? Hi, this is Tim Dolbear from Eclectica Studios. I'm a full-time mixing and recording engineer. I work with Grammy winners, labels, and indie artists. Using state-of-the-art digital mixing and restoration tools and the very best in analog gear. Really, though, it's my ability to bring tracks to life and fulfill your vision for your music. This has made me sought after by producers and artists worldwide. So spend your time working on music and not chasing a mix down a rabbit hole. Go to timdolbear.com and check out our free one song mix offer. You know what's all around you every waking moment of your life? Marketing. You're choking on it. I'm Scott Robertson, and when it comes to strategic PR, branding, and marketing, I've seen it all. And actually, I'm still seeing it because bad marketing never sleeps. Join me each week on May the Best Brand Win right here on Inner Talk Radio and learn how to make the marketing for your brand unforgettable. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio. To sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com.